Elsie back again, and um, I was particularly delighted to see that Hannah was coming on and we were talking about her book because one of the writers that she includes is someone that I wrote about a little while ago. I wrote a book on friendship um, a while ago. And so I got very interested in how friendships had played significant roles in history. And one of the friends, the couple that I um, focused on um, in a chapter which was about how friendship makes a difference politically was the friendship between um, the suffragettes, or actually they were called the ultras because they were kind of radical suffragettes. Um, the suffragettes, Elizabeth Candy Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And so they were figures in the American suffragette movement in the 19th century and um, before the American Civil War, in fact, was when they initially started getting going. And their story is very fascinating, partly for the nature of their friendship because they were the kind of friends who were kind of opposites, I think. Um, they weren't like birds of the feather flocking together. They were actually, as Plato put it, like the dry desert that longs for the wet rain. There was something about their opposite characters that drew them together. And when they came together, um, they became these sort of, this real core powerhouse um, in this ultras um, part of the suffragette movement. Um, it was said that um, Elizabeth Candy Stanton was a tremendous orator and was brilliant with ideas, whereas Susan B. Anthony um, was a great organiser and could kind of galvanise people and put things together in a practical way. Um, and then um, Elizabeth had a family and children and that um, pulled at her time, whereas um, Susan didn't. And so she was kind of freer to travel all those long distances in the time that it took in the 19th century. And so they were able to work together really well like that. But there's a kind of a bit of a, a sadness in the story too, um, because their friendship um, suffered because of the politics that they were involved with. And um, it, you know, it occurred to me that that's somewhat, it feels like, a problem that we face today in very divided times where people can get very exercised about certain issues and kind of at risk of forgetting the human side of things. And so their story was very much for me about how friendship must always almost trump, but never be forgotten at least when we get involved in political discussions. Because at the end of the day, the kind of various parts of our civic, social, political engagement, whether they be feminist or any other. I mean, the part which I experienced this more directly actually was in terms of gay politics, particularly back in the 80s and the 90s when I was quite involved in all that. And there, you know, you always had to remember that you were brought together by friendship more than anything else. And when you had disagreements and fallings out, it was really valuable to remember that side. And um, so just let me tell you so, a touch more about Elizabeth and Susan. Um, so what happened to them was that, and particularly at one point in their story, um, Elizabeth made a great speech, actually, which has been published subsequently called The Solitude of the Self. And it's one of the things which was her kind of philosophical mark, as much as her campaigning and more manifesto side of the work as well. And um, I'll just read a, a paragraph from it, because she talks about how her motivation in a way for being involved with the work was the sense that we're always basically alone, she felt. Um, and she argued this is one of the reasons why women need their independence because at the end of the day, we're always at risk of having to fall back on ourselves. Um, she talked about um, how the human condition is a bit like being Robinson Crusoe on the island. We must be able to be self-reliant. And that really hurt Susan. Um, because she felt that it was their friendship, really, that had enabled so much in their lives. Um, but Elizabeth, she says in this speech, she says, e in youth, our most di bitter disappointments, our brightest hopes and ambitions are known only to ourselves. Even our friendship and our love, we never share fully with one another. Alone, a woman goes to the gates of death to give life to every man that is born into the world. No one can share her fears. No one can mitigate her pangs. And if her sorrow is greater than she can bear, alone she passes beyond the gates into the vast unknown that she's alluding to the risk of death in childbirth at the time. And but you get that sense of 
alone we ultimately enter life, alone we must face its pangs and its pain, and alone ultimately we must face its death. And, and this was a great sadness to Susan, and in a way their friendship never quite recovered, I think, from this. Um, later, when Elizabeth's husband died and she was then on her own, she invited Susan to set up a kind of community for single women together. And Susan was very nervous about that because she wondered about the status of their friendship. Um, so, you know, their story is one of tremendous collaboration in one way and how difference can come to, together to achieve great things as they did in the American suffragette movement. Um, but also with this question mark about how politics and friendships relate to each other, that feels to me like a really important thing to reflect on now when civic disagreement, political, um, antagonism and so on feels very present to us today um, to always remember the human side, always remember the power of friendship um, that uh, ultimately is what keeps us human and can bring us together. And I like to think that this is actually a you know huge idler theme as well. If, if there's anything that marks um, the idler spirit, it must be, I think, how different people kind of come together in a spirit of friendship and sharing. And that's certainly one of the things which I hugely value that Tom and Victoria facilitate. So Tom, let me pass over to you and Hannah at this point. Well, thanks, Mark. Now, Hannah, let's go straight to you. Victoria introduced the book, um, and she's absolutely right. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic work of scholarship, um, about 650 pages long. God knows how many entries there are, but it's also a sort of beautiful object. Um, and I've been sort of gazing at it uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, pondering, I, I'm not sure we can see it at home, but um, this uh, book jacket comes off and there are holes in it, okay? <laughs> um, and they're like, it's got a red background. And it's quite a beautiful thing, but I don't really, it, it, does it have a meaning or is, it, is that a, just a sort of piece of abstract art? Hello everyone. Hi, it's really lovely to see you all and thanks. Thanks for that song and for those words. You know, my dad used to sing that song growing up. It has a deep place in my heart and does, as you will find out, connect with the song with which we will close. Um, so this book, yeah, it is very, it's a beautiful, beautiful object. And, um, and I think that the cover originally is based on a piece of feminist art. Um, and who knows what it means? We can only speculate as with lots of abstract art, but those of you uh, who are familiar with Barbara Hepworth will know about how she talked about piercing the hole in the, in the form and how that was a kind of sexual and liberating and exciting experience. And I think that the fact that there are these holes and underneath there's the sort of red, red cover, red flesh, I think that's not accidental. Anyway, it's quite lush. I do. I mean, it's a lush book, isn't it, Tom? It's a lush book, yeah. It's a sort of sensual cover. Um, it is sensual. On a feminist theme, didn't Henry Moore sort of steal that idea from? Uh, yeah, the men, and they always steal the women's ideas. Well, let's talk about um, how you got into this. Uh, in the flyleaf in your short biog, you say that you used to be a, well, at least you studied and wrote about Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes, the 16th century, 16th century? 17th, 17th. Um, and John Locke, who was soon after him. And, um, you know, I was, I think you say you changed your mind. You, you had your, you had your confidence raised. So what's the story there, sort of intellectually? Um, gosh, well, it's a complex story, I guess. But I mean, thinking particularly about Hobbes and Locke, you know, those figures of the Enlightenment, um, they wrote variously about how human beings are created free and equal and that the only way in which human beings can come to have authority over each other is when we consent to that, when we contract, when we agree to it. Um, but what they failed to see in this kind of new enlightenment vision <laughs> was that women <laughs> might be equal too. So the, the, the main kind of great thinkers of the enlightenment excluded women from their project. They kept women in the shadows. Women were still enslaved in this um, in this world view. And so it was partly just it was it was having read, having been immersed in Hobbes and Locke um, and then kind of seeing, <laughs> thinking, where, where are the women in this story? And from a kind of personal perspective, you know, I mean, it's a it's a conventional story on my part, which is that I had children 
And and then it became clear just sort of how unimportant, for example, my injured body was to doctors, how uninterested they were in, in that, um, how invisible the work was that I did at home as I looked after my children and my male colleagues kind of flew by in the grand ascendancy towards this and that. And I was just, you know, feeding. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a combination of having yeah been immersed in enlightenment philosophy and then myself starting to see um, when I found myself erased as a mother. Now, how did you put the book together? I mean, as we said, it, it must have been an absolutely enormous amount of reading, but um, and and you've unearthed all sorts of things that probably nobody's heard of in um, feminist literature. And I also want to ask: Is there some, are there? I mean, it seems like such a kind of obvious thing that has to exist are there you know are you building on previous anthologies so there are anthologies um i mean what i wanted to do is to kind of disrupt diversify expand globalize the canon so there's quite a familiar story that probably lots of you know about, which is the story of that feminism comes in waves, that there's the first wave of feminism, which is what Mark was talking about in the 19th century, the story of suffrage, and then you get the second wave, Simone de Beauvoir, um, in the 60s, and the third and the fourth. And the problem with that story is that it's a very narrow kind of white Western story, and actually, and it's a recent story, whereas if you look, it's like at, with anything, the more you look, the more you find that's there. And when you look, you see that the story of feminism is actually the story of the world, because feminism is just the objection to patriarchy and the history of the world is not a way the history of patriarchy so feminism is kind of as old as the world and so so that's why for example the book begins in the um, 15th century um, it could have begun earlier but it, it's an old and it's a global thing well this is a lovely beginning isn't it with Christine de Pizan who, who wrote the uh, the city of ladies and I, I'm not quite sure that she was French or Italian but she was um she was certainly quite young and I think she actually made quite a good living from her writing uh, which was, I, I guess, fairly unusual in 1405 in Paris. Can you tell us a bit more about her? It was really unusual. She's such an amazing woman. So she, yeah, so Christine de Pizan, um, born in Italy, born in Venice, actually, um, daughter of Thomas de Pizan, and then moved quite quickly to Paris, which is why Tom's confused about what her nationality was. And, um, but anyway, sort of luckily for her in a way, she was widowed quite young, which gave her this sort of liberation, as often in history, uh, that the widows are the, are the lucky ones. And, um, I mean, obviously, that's a ridiculous thing to say, but in the context of kind of um, marriage being a um, an oppressive yeah, institution, it's, it's freedom. Uh, there was freedom there. Anyway, so Christine de Pizan, so she made exactly, she was one of the first women that we know about to kind of make her money, to make her way th through her pen, through the exercise of her pen. And she wrote this amazing book called The City of Ladies that uh, there's an extract from in the book. And... Basically, it begins with Christine sitting in her office, a bit like Mark's office, or many of our offices, actually my office indeed, a book-lined office. Um, and it's she's surrounded by books written by men, and she looks in them to try to find any word that's favourable about women, any word that speaks, that praises women, and she can't find one. And she becomes completely depressed and full of self-loathing and ends up asking God why he created her as such a vile creature as a woman. And then when she's absolutely in the depths of despair, these three women appear to her in a blaze of light, says uh, Christine de Pizan, Lady Reason, Lady Rectitude and Lady Justice. And they say, we've come to comfort you, Christine. Um, and we're going to show you, we're going to build a city of ladies for you, which is going to be a city made out of bricks who are great women from the past. And so gradually they build this city of ladies, which is made of queens and Amazons and virtuous women throughout history, which then stands as this kind of proof that women can be great, as well as a sort of refuge from the harassment of men. Don't, doesn't she say that women, I mean, she claims that women actually invented language, I think, you know, and she says it's, it's really unfair that, um, 
men have kind of sidelined us because we basically basically invented all the important stuff agriculture i think as well as mentioned as a female invention is that right <laughs> yes no exactly she i mean she talked i mean there's this sort of quite strong um line in early modern feminism which is exactly this idea that that women are the kind of original creators i mean um you know that there aren't any you know that women give birth in so many ways to people um, and to civilization. Um, yeah, so this idea of women as the kind of original creators, the original cultivators. She does also, I seem to remember she sometimes says, um, you know, uh, oh, she was a very good wife to blah, blah, because, um, you know, she made sure he wasn't disturbed while he was working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's right. So we can't expect to find, you know, 21st century values in 15th century texts. Well, let's um, go with Mary Wollstonecroft. She's one yeah. of the big ones. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we, most people, I suppose, well, a lot of people know the key biographical facts. You know, she was Mary Shelley's mother. Um, and she was married to, this is my little fragment I remember, she, she was married to William Godwin. Well, William Godwin was sort of one of the first mm. anarchists, really, of the um, mm. 1790s or whatever. Mm. Uh, and I remember reading, uh, when they got married, we know it didn't end, you know, it didn't last that long because she died. Um, but uh, when they got married, she said, and that wasn't her first marriage either, um, Mr. Godwin and I will dine out separately as before. Yeah. A radical statement. Like we're not going to go around as some sort of couple. You know, we're still individual people. That's right. And actually, she didn't marry before, Tom. She she fought all her life not to marry, precisely not to be kind of constrained by wedlock, you know, which she understood as a sort of form of prostitution. I mean, and, and indeed, uh, if you think about early modern marriage at the time, there isn't really such a thing, for example, as marital rape. So once you've once you've um, you know contracted yourself in marriage, you're mm -hmm. thought to have consented to sex, um, and therefore it's not possible for your for your husband to rape you. So that just gives you a sense of what of what why she what she was pushing it back against in the context of marriage. And it was only very latterly that she um, that she married William Godwin. Um, because she'd had a child previously with Gilbert Imlay, um, who was called, um, who was she named Fanny after her dear, dear friend Fanny Blood, who died. I mean, she does have well, Mary Wollstonecraft. For those of you who don't know or don't know the whole story, has the most unbelievable life. I mean, it is an extraordinary life of independence, of liberation, of heartache. Um, and as Tom says, think of this woman. Um, she, she writes the vindication of the rights of women, which is a response to all those enlightenment figures like Tom Paine, who wrote about the rights of man. And she says, hang on a minute, you know, we're here too. What about women? Uh, uh, don't we have rights? She, she, she has this life. Um, she gives birth exactly to her daughter, Mary, and dies as a result of having given birth. And her daughter, Mary, goes on to marry Shelley, writes Frankenstein. Her other daughter dies by suicide. I mean, it's the most extraordinary life. But one thing that I'm really interested in doing is precisely not reducing her ideas to her life. Um, I mean, I think, you know, so I'm a philosopher, I teach philosophy. And um, when I teach Kant, Rousseau, Locke, people have no difficulty thinking of them as kind of these philosophers writing, as it were, from this abstracted plane about universal, epic, important things. Whereas people can't help but talk about Wollstonecraft, as you did, but that's fine, um, by beginning, as it were, with her life. And what I really want to do with these thinkers, I mean, what this book is in part about is exactly about trying to sort of untether these writers from their circumstances and let their ideas um, occupy the same sort of important plane, the same epic plane that male philosophers are allowed to occupy. Which is obviously a, a brilliant thing to do. It is funny how when you start, when you talk about women, you start talking about their sort of biographical details. I mean, I think we're all interested actually in the- I know. Of, of the men too, but- Of course. Um, but yeah, you don't want to get bogged down and making it into some sort of Mills and Boone drama about... Um, <laughs> no. 
Well, that obviously belittles what she, what she was writing about, what she was thinking. And how Although, she- of course, the interesting thing is that it is a core mantra of feminism. And Mary Wollstonecraft, you know, plugs into this, that the personal is political. So I think that, that it's also crucial, exactly, to think about the ways in which the biography is itself a, a political matter and um, that the personal is political, that what, see, what goes on, you know, behind closed doors, in bedrooms, in kitchens, um, in private space is itself shaped by relations of power. Um, that's, you know, that's the thought. But it is just so interesting if you think about how, how different, even when men write about the personal, they're still thought, they're still kind of allowed to be speaking in this kind of epic way. Like, I don't know if you've read, those of you who've read Knausgaard, um, but anyway, he right. You have a go at him in the in your introduction, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I just think it's very funny that he writes about changing his baby's nappy, which is great. Yeah. Um, but everyone's but and that's sort of thought of as this epic text. Whereas Rachel Cusk writes about changing her baby's nappy, and everyone says, "God, she's so narcissistic." <laughs> um, so there's a kind of you know there is a sort of double standard. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's what's so good because it's, it's, and your you know your choice of stuff and your politics are kind of woven right through it so i mean what was her her book came out in when 1790s and two uh, yeah 1792 yeah um how was it sort of received at the time do you think no um well it made her famous i mean um what i'm trying to say is um she wasn't the only one no no there was a there was a kind of there must have been a sort of uh, she, uh, you know, she came out of a probably, you know, these, these things come out of conversations, and um, there might be other, you know, 1790s female philosophers that we sort of forgotten about. Yes, yes. So there are many. Um, I mean, one person who um, you you might who is it, who's in the book, and you might like to know about Idler members is um, Olympe de Gouges, who um, was writing in the French Revolution, a Parisian writing in the French Revolution, and unlike Mary Wollstonecraft, actually, who who did think that m- men and women had this kind of had distinct roles in life, um, and that there was a kind of natural gravity that would see women live in the home, as it were, and men live in the public sphere. Um, Olympe de Gouges was far more radical and um, wanted women to have the vote, wanted women to participate in civil society in a full way, equal with men, for which she was executed. So uh, that didn't end well. That's how dangerous those ideas were seen by the authorities. Yes, yes. Um, I think, shall I say a little bit about what's, I mean, what I think is so amazing about Mary Wollstonecraft is the way that she understands how power affects selfhood and um, psyches. So if it's the case that you live in a society where you're completely dependent on your father or your husband, that you have no freedom outside that patriarchal relationship, then you spend your entire time and you turn your entire self to trying to please um, the person who has power over you. So you kind of empty yourself out and spend your entire time trying to fluff up and flatter the ego of the person who, who has power over you, which and, you know, coupled with that, if if your only kind of value in the world is for your beauty or your role as a sexual object, you'll spend all of your time pouring yourself into those things rather than thinking about how to be a full, robust, independent person. So I think, yeah, I think that the way in which she thinks about power and ideas becoming internalised in, in people um, is just, she has them, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what she says, and it feels to me like that's a completely relevant, resonant idea. It's still relevant now, isn't it? Because you, you talk about some um, Nigerian feminist philosophers, I think from the 70s or 80s, um, and they're saying the same thing to their students and girls, you know. Um, <laughs> if, you know, don't get too intellectual because no one will want to marry you, it's what some of the mothers, the mothers say, and this sort of thing, you know. Um, so it's still going on, you know, 200, two, 300 years later. Definitely, yeah. Um, there have been resistances against this. And, uh, well, we're going to talk about Simone de Beauvoir and stuff, but can we just skip to the sort of punk 
um, <laughs> feminism you talk about. I suppose it has its roots in someone like Valerie Solon- Solon- Solonas. Solanus, yes, amazing. Society for Cutting Up Men, the Scum yeah. Manifesto. I think she said that, you know, men would swim through a river of shit if they thought that there was a shag at the other end of it. <laughs> Yes, it is the most amazing book. I don't know if people here have have read it or looked at it, but it's a kind of thrilling, it's a thrilling read, The Scum Manifesto. Um, um, I'm just wondering if I can, well, I don't know. Have you got the page number for it? Because it does have a really good um, beginning. Um, let's have a quick look, yeah. Um, well, or you find it. I'll just talk I'm about... Talking. Yeah. So, um, so the other kind of punk, the big punk voice in the book is um, is Bikini Bills, uh, Bikini Kills, um, Riot Girl Manifesto, um, and I mean it's just so it's so powerful and a kind of protest against capitalism, against violence, against um, against internalized misogyny, against the way in which women are in which a patriarchal uh, culture undervalues women, which women then internalize and turn against each other in this kind of competition. So it's not only a kind of resistance to patriarchy, but it's also a celebration of girl love and girl solidarity um, and and safety as well. Um, and, and, and kind of protesting any sort of ladylike ideas about what women should be. Um, yeah, it's an amazing, it's an amazing piece as well. You know, punk, punk in the 70s was, uh, you know, I mean, a band like Crass, which was the great anarchist punk band, you know, they were very, it was men and women were in the band. Um, they were sort of hardcore feminists, they were vegan, you know, they brought these quite sort of bohemian ideas to, a, to really quite a sort of wide audience. But look, I found the, um, the bit, do you want me to read a bit or do you want to read? The scum, where, where, what page is it? Oh yeah, it's page two four one. Page two four one. Yeah. One. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's right. I'll just read the opening lines because I think they are quite cool. Um, life in this society being at best an utter bore, and no aspect of society being at all relevant to women. There remains to civic-minded, responsible, thrill-seeking females only to overthrow the government, eliminate the money system, institute complete automation, and destroy the male sex. (laughs) Now, the thing is, what I need to say to the audience is that it is not it is not at all the case that I, that feminism is anti men and it's not at all the case that most of the voices in this book take that tone but given that tom brought it up and given that he is an anarchist it is it is a good reading for tom yeah and it's you know that's what goes what is woven through really isn't it that um uh is it, am i right to say you know feminism is well you say in the introduction it's a kind of statement of the obvious fact that you know women exist um and as you say that men seem to sort of forget that um but it's, it's essentially an, an anti-capitalist or at least anti-authoritarian um idea of feminism and that's why i just wanted to conclude this bit of the chat um by thinking a bit about cheryl sandberg who is the who you mentioned and i sort of have thought about quite a bit um if the idol is about trying to avoid work, Carol Sandberg, she's like number two at Facebook, um, wrote a book called Lean In. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, it was called Lean In Feminism. And she had these sort of shows where she would gather, you know, go getting women in the audience. And and they would say, you know, they would stand up like, a bit like a, one of those sort of religious rallies and say, you know, I leaned in and I got that raise. And, <laughs> um, and I was like, there's something a bit uncomfortable about that, but I didn't really want to say anything. But then uh, there was an essay in The Baffler by, I think, um, uh, Susan Faludi, and you mentioned another one, which basically attacked that version of feminism, I think, for being, uh, well, sort of corporate, I suppose. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. So the book that I mentioned is Dawn Foster's book, Lean Out, um, which is a brilliant riposte to Sandberg's Lean In. Um, uh, I mean, there are many objections to um, the Lean In philosophy. I mean, one is that, and this is a kind of intersectional point, that um, 
this kind of individualistic liberal feminism that um, uh, that suggests you know that women just need to lean in in order to um, uh, you know empower and further their own goals often involves in a kind of capitalistic society often involves us leaning on other people and this was Audre Lorde's point in her the master's um, house won't be you know the master's tools won't dismantle the master's house that and it's and it applies to me you know that she says you know what are what are white women attending fem conferences on feminist theory um doing well they're people of women of color are looking after their children at home so there's a way in which um we have to be careful, says Dawn Foster, to lean out in solidarity with other women rather than to lean in at the expense of other women. So Sheryl Sandberg's not really presenting a kind of model for liberation, is she? Well, not liberation for all. I mean, that's the point. Yeah. You know, it might be liberation for individual yeah. women, but it's not liberation for all. And if feminism is about, the, you know, standing up against the oppression of women, standing up against injustice, then it makes it's incoherent to think that injustice only applies to you or to me. It has to apply to everyone. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not a it's not a cogent movement. Just one last question before we go to go to questions, Vic. Is that okay? Yeah, um, you mentioned Emma Goldman. She, she pops up quite a lot as a anarchist figure. Um, I don't know much about her really. Can you sort of give us a quick sort of swift summary of what she writes about? Well, you've said it. I mean, she isn't. She's an anarchist socialist who. Um... Uh, you know, doesn't have much truck, for example, with the kind of conventional women's suffrage movement. She thinks that the vote's not going to save us. You know, what we need is kind of a complete overthrow um, of the government and a renovation of um, a renovation of of capitalism. And um, I mean, particularly in the context of sex and gender, she's thinking about free love um, and the liberation exactly from sort of marriage and mon monogamy and um, the ties that bind us. So the anarchism is one that runs through politics and gender and the ways in which those two intersect. Just finally, we, we had, um, uh, was it last week, Vic, or the week before, we had Ruth Kinner on, who's uh, an academic and um, anarchist writer. And she was talking about the movement. Talking about in, anarchism last week, yeah. Yeah, last week um, in Rojava, which is quite interesting. <laughs> I can't remember that uh, there's a woman called Debbie Butchin, who's the daughter of Murray Butchin, who is a sort of Jewish uh, urban New York anarchist whose ideas have been taken up by groups of uh, feminist women in northern Syria. Have you come across that? I haven't. That sounds brilliant. Quite, that sounds yeah, brilliant. It's quite an amazing story. That is amazing. I mean, of course, that is the extraordinary feature of when we when we get depressed about the internet, we also have to think about the way in which um, it facilitates global movements. If you think about the way that the internet lit up over Me Too, I mean, that is a very, that is an exciting thing. Yeah, it, it, it can sort of move things around. Now, sorry, I've got another final question. <laughs> um, <laughs> idleness in women. Um, Idleness. Idleness in women. You know, women. I've always been criticised. You know, well, it's all right for men to sit around doing nothing, and you know, women, women doing all the work. But you know, the, really, what from quite early on, uh, with the magazine, the Idler, uh, we wanted to say, well, no, it's, it's idleness for everybody. It's not just, it's not just for men. Um, but because work uh, is seen as a sort of you know, route towards liberation or at least financial freedom for women. Um, you know, has feminism got a bit sort of mixed up with the idea of, you know, I've got to work, work, work really, really hard. I mean, it's like um, uh, <coughs> you know, immigrants into this country feel they have to work sort of doubly hard um, to the uh, indigenous people to sort of make it. Um, so the idea of being idle uh, seems like a kind of step backwards. Yeah. No, I. Sorry. But it shouldn't. It, to me, like um, 
you know, women sitting around doing nothing would be a, a, a fantastic act of resistance. It would. And I think that many feminists would agree with you. I mean, I, I mean, actually, you know, within feminism, and this is something that comes out really strongly in the book and that I became really interested in, there is a very old, very strong strand within feminism, which exactly is all about... Um, women's work, the kind of Sisyphean business of being a woman. Um, and of course, it's not just in the context of, of kind of wage slavery that women are exploited and, um, you know, you know that they su suffer terrible kind of employment um, conditions in all sorts of ways, but that of course, in a way they suffer the worst employment condition of all, which is that they do vastly the majority of, of um, unpaid work. Um, you know, in the house, um, cleaning, cooking, caring, um, and then all the emotional labour that goes on as well. Um, and it's not just the case that that's poorly paid, it's the case that that's not paid at all. And so part of the history of feminism has exactly been about kind of dispelling the myth that this is what Silvia Federici calls kind of labours of love. The idea is, oh, women do look after their babies, they look after their parents because they love them. It's a labour of love. And what feminists have said is it's labour and it should be paid for. And that's what the Labour government, funnily enough, um, instituted when they introduced um, the child benefit, which was paid to the mothers as remuneration for the work that they did. Unfortunately, that's going out the window. Is that going out the window? Well, you know, it became kind of means tested, and then I mean, I, I don't, I don't hold much hope. <laughs> it's, all sort of, it's all sort of changed. Um, awful and that lot. Really, is it? Ideas like basic income, which is uh, uh, our friend Guy Standing's idea. But anyway, sorry. It's a very good idea. Yeah, um, Victoria, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Can chip in and um, get the audience in. Well, there, yeah, le lots of questions. Could we start with Courtney, please? Um, Courtney, will you ask your question? And then I think we'll go to Kathleen. Yep. Courtney, let's Can you hear me? This. Yeah. Hi, Kathleen. Can you hear me all right? Courtney, you're in the car. I'm in the car. I'm a woman sitting outside my son's kung fu lesson getting my armor <laughs> talk. So oh, that, that's a zone of freedom. I can confirm car, yeah. it right here. This is my entertainment during uh, drop-offs. Um, having spent, I've got your book, by the way, and I'm afraid because I don't have any time, I, I kind of pick it up, look at it and go, someday I will read this. Um, <laughs> But having spent so much time in the history of, of, of feminism and in the past, and um, what would you say are the major issues fe facing feminism today? If you were to kind of pick sort of one issue, what would you campaign on most? What is the biggest problem we've got right now? And I know that might be global, so maybe keep to the UK or sort of, you know, maybe Western Europe or the US. That's a brilliant question. Shall I go to that immediately, Victoria? Yes, 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 go. That's such a good question, Courtney. Can I give two answers? One is mm. that I think, um, I think childcare, I think that the way in which, um, you know, you can see it in terms of what happens to women's careers, what happens to women's earnings when they have children, um, that it just kind of, you know, flatlines mm. goes, I think that, that the state needs to provide <laughs> childcare. There needs to be structural solutions and it shouldn't be our private problems. Mm. Um, it shouldn't be our private problem, childcare. And then the other thing I think, the big question is obviously, how do we solve the problem of violence against women? How do we solve mm. the problem of male violence against women? And I've been very inspired by abolition feminists like Angela Davis and Lola Olufemi, who, who, you know, point to the truth that is becoming ever more obvious that the the state is not solving the problems of violence at the moment. I mean, rape is an unprosecuted involved. crime. Mm. Um, and um, so the idea that violence can't solve the problems of violence and having and wanting to think much more holistically about, you know, funding education, housing, just knowing that, that, that the state is um, capable of act, enacting violence as well as protecting us. And in fact, it doesn't protect us at all. No. So what do we do about the fact that the state doesn't protect us? Well, we have to think beyond the state in terms of solutions to male violence. Mm. Do you think misogyny is increasing? Um, it's, I mean, there's this brilliant 
concept um, uh, um, formulated by a historian called Judith Bennett called the patriarchal equilibrium, <laughs> which basically talks about how over time um, things might seem to get a bit better, but then the patriarchy has a way of kind of reasserting itself. Especially so there's a sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so um, I mean, I do feel, I did feel quite punched in the stomach when um, Me Too, you know, lit up the internet and every woman had a story to tell and nothing changed. No. Oh, Courtney's gone. Um, nothing's, nothing, no, 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 that's fine. No, but do you know what I mean? That nothing changed. I mean, then I did feel, wow, you know, what will it take? What will it take mm. for this to be a problem that is seen? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. What will it take? It's, yeah. So in a way, the more that... We need. Yeah. So the, so exactly. So the more it's kind of evidence, the more it's visible, and yet the more nothing changes. I just think, blimey, what will, what will it take? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for your lovely question. Yes. Thank question, you very much Courtney. for your book. Thank you. And um, Kathleen, will you ask your question? But Kathleen's got two very good questions, actually. But on that, I think in a way, let's start with your second question, Kathleen, because in a way it links a bit um, yes, because yes. it's such awful awful problems but then you've we've got a laugh and you're laughing and Courtney's good humored always and so Kathleen will you ask your second actually I have to admit that we Kathleen is very important to the idler she's actually the power behind the idler secretly she's the most intelligent and organized of all of us <laughs> and sadly because she too is an academic we don't have her as much as we want to at the moment, but we're enormous fans. Kathleen, sorry to embarrass you. Do ask okay, a question, fine. and then um, we'll see you. Thank you, Hannah, for for your um, for your talk, but also for your amazing book, which is um, yeah, like Victoria said, such a. I hope it will become required reading um, for people in some way. But what I wanted to ask about is how important do you think um, joy and laughter and kind of um, also friendship, maybe linking to what Mark was talking about, are. In, in, in feminist thought and, and practice. Um, I'm just thinking about like, you know, how that kind of uh, archetype of the angry feminist is something that's still so pervasive. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's really problematic and really limiting and actually not at all representative of also some of the writing you have in that book. Um, so I just wondered what you thought the place was of, of happiness and, and laughter and joy. That's such a lovely question. Um... And so, I mean, I think it's hugely important. Um, but before saying that, obviously, I mean, this was a thing that I wrestled with, actually, in the book and in my selection, um, in the sense that if what feminism is, is the resistance to sexism and patriarchy, it's a it, it is the, it's about oppression, it's about injustice. And so the core of it is grim. <laughs> I mean, the cause of feminism, the reason we need to have feminism in the first place is because there's, there are these grim things. So there is a way in which one doesn't, I think it's important not to erase that, not to pretend that's not there. But um, it's equally important um, in terms of liberation and in terms of um, kind of agency that we precisely inhabit these abundant, joyous, together selves. Um, and, and that that itself is also feminist praxis, that itself is, um, is a form of liberation. And, and one thing I really wanted to do in the book is exactly kind of speak to the, the humour, the sisterhood, the, um, the pleasure, you know, the pleasure of, of friendship and the pleasure of, um, the pleasure of self-realisation. Um, in a way. So that's something that Mary Wollstonecraft talks about, for example, is what it's like, you know, having been brought up to sort of sit quietly and make yourself as small as possible on a chair and not be a, a, a allowed to kind of run around outside and develop a robust body like the boys are. Um, she, this, I, and, that, and she goes walking in Scandinavia, um, Mary Wollstonecraft does, and that's all about this kind of walking into an embodiment of robust, sturdy selfhood. Um, yeah, it's hugely important. It's the art, it's the aim. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm also thinking, like, also thinking about how funny Mary Wollstonecraft sometimes is. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, 
the way she takes down work or or some other people you know she she uses humor in, in kind of feminist ways i think which is quite funny yeah that's so true she's really witty yeah out of interest, how, how much did Mary Shelley know about her mother's writing? Did she sort of follow the message? It feels as if, it, as if she didn't, because she was sort of maybe, you know, being unbelievably creative in her own right, but maybe following men around a bit more. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, um... I mean, Frankenstein, you know, um, is obviously this creature that sort of doesn't have a mother. I mean, I think there's, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of very interesting scholarship on this. Uh, one of the most lovely reflections that I've read recently is Jeanette Winterson's book, Frankenstein, um, which looks, has this gorgeous portrait of, um, of Mary Shelley, Byron, Shelley, um, and and the way in which the story comes to the young Mary. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about, I can't talk about the psychology. Right. I just, I don't know. But I feel like, she read how it. can we know? I mean, what can it have been like to, to be the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, who died as a result of your birth? I mean, we need Mark Vernon to kind of, to help us even begin to pass that sort of, impossible massive truth do you know what i mean i mean it's so extraordinary to me what it must have been like to be mary da mary shelley daughter of mary wollstonecraft knowing that in some ways you'd killed your mother but also that your mother had died um you know that your mother had died as a result of her sex as a result of the fact that she had given birth to you i mean it's I mean, just this is, this is not an answer to the personal trauma hmm. at all but one of the feminist philosophers of religion, actually, who was very influential on me at the time, was a woman called Grace Janssen. And one of her big ideas, really, was that another thing to tackle in all of this is the relationship between um, life and death. And she felt that one of the things which we become fixated on in the modern world is death and sort of putting off death as much as possible. When she, where she liked to talk about what she called natality and seeing always how life and death are actually, you know, interwoven with each other. And, you know, there is the horror, of course, of, uh, of, of death through childbirth and so on. But it's also this extraordinary moment where those two things come together. And so she tried to write about what she called natality and felt that we really need that in the modern world. Mm, that's really interesting. And it reminds me of something that I also found very helpful and um, powerful thinking about black feminism. Um, the idea that, because obviously the struggle is long, the struggle doesn't end, and this goes back to Courtney's question, you know, um, and so what are we to make of that? How are activists, how are kind of, you know, fighters against injustice to navigate the fact that things don't seem to get better, that things seem to sometimes go backwards, and and then drawing on this idea of time kind of looping rather than just being linear and being connected back to sort of ancestors and... Um, being part of a kind of shared project through time, which precisely sort of transcends death, to speak to Mark's point. There's an amazing uh, book called The Mermaid of Black Conch, which I've just read by Monique Roffey. I don't know if anyone's read that. It's so wonderful, but it's exactly about kind of intergenerational trauma and intergenerational redemption. Right, that's one for reading list as well. At least a couple of books there. Um, I'm really conscious that we're running out of time, which is awful, because I do want Kathleen to ask her second question, which is important to me too. But can we quickly go to John Hughes? John, we'll try and squeeze your question in quickly, and I'm sorry everybody else who's got one. Um, but John, if you could quickly unmute and ask your question, and then we'll finish with Kathleen's second question. Uh, thanks, Victoria. Thanks, Mark and Hi, Tom. John. Uh, congratulations on your book, Hannah. Um, I just want to ask a question about two female heroes that I've got. One is Amy Johnson, who flew, flew solo to Australia, did some wartime work, celebrated in Al Stewart's song, Flying Sorcery on Year of the Cat, among other things, and Hedy, Hedy Lamarr, who got into the torpedo jamming technology. And what interests me is that 
these they broke into male dominated worlds and just showed through their actions. I don't think they were political. I don't know if they self identified as feminists. And I'm just wondering if that's another kind of angle of influence to celebrate these these people. That's such a lovely question, John. I mean, there is actually within kind of feminist thought, um, a, a, this thing called air mindedness, which is exactly what this idea of um, yeah, being in the air and what that means in terms of space and, and, and the world and transcending national and domestic boundaries and, and being penned in. And actually, you know, women historically have been very, at the forefront of kind of international political thought, of thinking internationally um, in terms of peace, in terms of exactly transcending the nation, transcending particular governments, making solidarity, you know, amongst people um, around the world. And I think that well, I mean, there are many answers to what you uh, just asked, but I think that one of the, it's very interesting to think about the internationalism and the pacifism that goes with being in the air. Does that? Yeah, thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you. Oh, thanks, and thanks, Hannah. Thanks, John. And Kathleen, would you ask your other question, please? Um, it's just a really quick question. Um, I just wondered which book you would recommend to um, maybe a young teenager, teenage girl first discovering feminism. Or is there a book that you wish you'd read at age 14? I know. I'm, I'm just going to get it from my bookshelf, which is, well, obviously, I think that, um, I think that everyone should have my book. But I also think that this book by Bell Hooks, which is called Feminism is for Everybody, is a really accessible, brilliant guide that, you know, a 14 year old um, could read and get and it would just be a fantastic kind of shortcut. I mean, it took me really, frankly, about 40 years to understand these things. It would have been really nice if I'd have read them when I was 14. Perfect. There we go. That's on my teenagers list already. Hannah, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tom. Um, next week, we've got the comedian Arthur Smith, so I really hope you join us with him. Uh, I might send a link as well to Idler T-shirts. Tom, you've been modelling the Idler T-shirt, I think, tonight. So I'll send that in a minute. Blah, but blah, first, blah. Thank oh, well, they... <laughs> um, I'll send a link to that as well, because they're um, being sold by Rough. You can get them in medium but... now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, don't know we were, I know we had some problems with the retail supply early on early on in the uh be <laughs> nined out now thank you um but uh in a moment will you all start unmuting because i want you to give hannah a massive round of applause but first hannah will you tell us why you chose the song we're just about to play please and thank you so much for coming tonight it's just been a joy Oh, good. Well, it's been really lovely to be here. I didn't know what it'd be like. It's like a party. It's really, really nice. Um, um, yeah, so the song that I chose is um, Peggy Seeger's version of Union Made, which is a song about feminism and about class and the way in which if we are feminists, we have also to think about class. And I have sung this song on the picket line, um, Fighting for Fair Pay um in the in higher education which is an ongoing struggle <laughs> um anyway yeah i love it I've, i love this song i love peggy and i've sung it myself many times in the streets on the strand brilliant and it's it's great to watch her singing so i'm going to set that up but meanwhile everybody please give hannah and tom and martin an enormous round of applause <laughs> 